We are live oh, on No Driving Gloves. What was Will saying? I don't know. Come on, Will. <laughs> yeah. John does the throw, yeah. throw off. You know, I got right. to nice. do what I can to screw it up. I, I'm trying to do a nice, what do you call it? Aggressive hip radio DJ voice. You know, we're live here on No Driving Gloves, and we got Will, and we got Derek, and we screwed up because I forgot and deleted the theme song off my little board here. So, you know, welcome to No Driving Gloves, where three hosts, you know, Derek, Will and John get together and we chat about cars. Da 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 da. Brought to you by J. Lewis Productions. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and Big Oak Garage. But so it's a little show with just us three for the first time uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, sat down with Greg a couple of weeks ago and chatted about some stuff. Uh, sat down with uh, Copart last week and, uh, um, made me want to spend too much damn money. At least I got something to do at night when I'm laying in bed, when I'm just supposed to be watching TV. Um, what are you, are you, you guys doing anything exciting? I don't care what you did this week. Right? So. I'm just sharing our live feed on my Facebook page. Ooh, all right. Ooh, <laughs> fancy. When Will shares, we get actually viewers usually. Yeah. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. So, you know, I, we shared to the Facebook page this week. Uh, we've got a new thing going on. If you follow our Instagram for sure, um, doing a daily this week in automotive history. And, you know, the, the seatbelt was patented earlier this week. That old famous Volvo story about the seatbelt. Um, I think today in history, nope, tomorrow in history, the uh, Carmen Ghia was introduced to the world. I mean, we've had some pretty interesting. Ooh. You know, actually, John, that would be that would be a better twist for our show. Instead of doing today in history, we need to start tomorrow in history. Ooh, that's and write about what happened tomorrow in history. Hmm. I like that. Maybe I'll change it up. Why? Follow us on Instagram to see if John listens to yeah. Eric. Uh, uh, so, we're in why I brought up social media, not necessarily to say, you know, like us on Facebook or uh, follow us on Instagram or go to the website, nodrivinggloves.com, was we did share a post from a, 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 this little shop in, you know, kind of nowhere, Alabama, that they trucked on up to Ohio and they did some kind of cool things this weekend. Will, how was your weekend in Ohio? Oh, uh, well, it was it was busy, first off. Uh, got up there. Well, on the way up there, uh, Wednesday, we had to stop in Chattanooga. The Rocket Camaro and the Rocket 280Z was actually in a really, really bad crash uh, in the trailer Wednesday morning on their way to Columbus. So, totaled the truck, totaled the trailer... Luckily, the cars wasn't hurt too bad, so we stopped in Chattanooga to check out the the two cars, you know, that we'd built to make sure they were okay, and make sure Darren was okay that was driving uh, the the truck and trailer, and and luckily Darren was okay, and and both the cars had, you know, minimal damage for for what the truck and trailer went through. So that's how I started off the trip to Columbus. We got there. Thursday morning, had a photo shoot with uh, for ET Motor Gear. Got something cool to announce about that in, in the coming up future. Can't really say anything right now. Yeah, you can. Go ahead. Tell us. Tell us. <laughs> Rod, Rod <laughs> might kill me. Um, oh, that, that's a might. You didn't say we'll kill you. It's a yeah. might. Let's take the risk. Yeah. So uh, then um, met up with uh, Robert McGaffin, who we've had on. Uh, the podcast before, uh, one of the owners of Wheel Hub, Chevy Hub, Mustang Hub, Truck Hub, and he shot the 57 that we brought up there for Chevy Hub magazine. So, I mean, we started off we started off pretty strong. Don't, don't just skate over that because we're planning on having the Wheel Hub guys back to talk about another magazine, I believe. So Right, right. That's, yeah. that's a ball in Will's court, so when, yeah. you know, when yeah, he gets a minute. <laughs> they're definitely wanting to come back on, so we'll get those guys on soon. So, you know, just went to the show Friday, hung out, had a good time, got to see a bunch of my friends I hadn't seen in in, in hell a year. Wait, wait, wait. We got to make fun of John because he almost ruined the big, big news because he just flashed his screen in, at the inappropriate time. 
<laughs> I, I, I always flash at the inappropriate time. Well, actually, is there really an inappropriate time to flash? No, no, not at all. <laughs> so we go back to the show on Saturday, you know, parking the builder's choice. The, you know, they don't really judge at good guys. They do picks, but uh, in the picking area, or one of them, they have several. Oh, episode 145, if you want to go back and learn about Truck Hub, Wheel Hub, et cetera. So. There you go. So, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're hanging out there and, Good guys started a new award this year called the Chevrolet Builder of the Year. And honestly, I, I, I hadn't really read much about it. I've seen where certain guys have won it, you know, Bobby Alloway, Jonathan Goolsby, Weaver Customs. Try I can't I can't remember all of them that's won it right now, but you know, big name guys are winning this award. And Saturday afternoon, about 3, 3.30, Harry from Good Guys walks up and congratulates me and lets me know that I'd won the um, Chevrolet Iron, GM Iron Builder of the Year finalist. So, you know, I, I was I was very surprised at that. I mean, the, the 57 that we took up there, don't get me wrong, it is a nice car. Uh, but I personally didn't feel that it was um, – the nicest one of the nicest gm cars there i mean it it it, it, really, it holds a candle you know but it's not it's not an over-the-top build uh it was built you know uh for for mark shaver up in uh, upstate new york and and he didn't want an over-the-top car he didn't want something that was so nice that he was scared to drive and he had you know a war pension in so I mean it's a it's a well built fifty seven Chevy. It's straight as an arrow. It's got great gaps. It's got good interior. It's nice underneath, but it just don't have all those custom, you know, cut touches that you know we we find ourselves doing here at Big Oak, which is which is cool to me because the fifty seven Chevrolet looks looks really really good anyway. You don't have to cut them up to to have a really cool car. So. So to get that award with with a stock body 57 was was pretty special. So I, I guess the biggest thing about that car is the is the engine compartment. It does have a supercharged 572 with a Magnuson supercharger. It's all EFI and man this thing pounds the ground. It is very aggressive. So that's probably what separated that car from all the other cars there with it being a general motors performance crate 572 that we supercharged. So I have a feeling that's probably one of the big things that got the car, the attention that it got last weekend in Columbus. So when you win that award, when you win a finalist with good guys, you get a small feature in the Gazette. So after they gave us the award, hooked up with John Jackson, uh, who was there shooting a lot of the cars for good guys that weekend, and had another photo shoot. So three three photo shoots in one weekend. I, I think that's the first time that I've ever had to do that. It was. But you only had what? One car there or two cars there? One. <laughs> three, three photo shoots with the. Uh... One car, I'm assuming, yeah, because it, yeah, it, yeah. You, you, were, you weren't posing for uh, any magazines. <laughs> no, no, they don't want my ugly mug in there. They want the car. Uh, so that that's what transpired this past weekend at Good Guys. I was uh, very, very pleased, very overwhelmed with with what with what we won with with that car, and you know, looking forward to October when they announce. The winner, because I'm in the running for, for builder of the year now. So we'll see what happens. Oh, yeah, I, I figured nice. you were kind of busy. Yeah. Um, I think I heard Derek um, but I'm gonna overstep no, the I, here. I, I said actually, very nice, but you're over. You're talking over me. Yeah. Well, you're the one who forgot your microphone. So no. <laughs> it's that DJ thing. I turned my mic up louder than everybody else. Um, I was doing my uh, little side hustle computer gig on Saturday and I actually called you because I had somebody come in with a question 
And I figured I was going to mention it on the podcast because maybe some of your friends are listening. And I called you because you might know the answer. Me? Yep. Oh. Why the heck doesn't Holly put on their website what the basic parameters are for a computer to program their EFI system? If you search it, all you do is you go to Holly forums. Why wouldn't Holly put on their website that if you're buying the Holly, was it the Intimidator system or something? It would say you need a Windows 10 computer or a Windows 7 computer or because this guy was trying to decide whether or not he could buy the cheap Windows 10 S machine or the Windows 10. And I figured I'd call my buddy Will and Will didn't pick up. And we ended up, we actually got a hold of Holly at like 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning and got our answer. But why the heck isn't it on the website? <laughs> Next time you're talking to your buddies at Holly, <laughs> nice, simple thing that would come in handy because if I wasn't a computer or a car geek selling computers, and I was just a computer geek, no offense, computer geeks, um, we would have really been in trouble. <laughs> well, I only, I only heard like every other word. I'm, I heard every word. I'm a little offended because, I mean, Holly teaches their classes at, at you know, the Corvette Museum like every couple of weeks. They're actually there right now. But who does John call? A Will, because... You know, Will builds the cars. He doesn't call Derek, who all he's got to do is walk around the corner and talk to one of the main guys from Holly about everything. Uh, yeah, Derek. Or, you know, drive uh, the street to their world headquarters. Well, maybe because if Will's I ever actually, been to the class and you just walk them watching, you just watch them walk in the building. <laughs> if I'm going to call Derek about something, it's going to be about gravity feed carburetors or what? It, what was that one you were working on lately that had a wick or something? And you know. Yeah, you know. So, but, hot tube so, ignition, well, something well, like Der that. Der Der Derek, take that on for yourself. Wander down the hall tomorrow and say, hey, John on the podcast, since he's all knowing, all will, you know, willing, he'll do anything in the world, and he's always right. He says, you guys need to do this for your website. I'll, because I'll it would talk make to it, it, would make, it would make him make it easier for him to sell a computer which I did sell a computer for the company. I'll have you your answer tomorrow. <laughs> so that was my thing. Did you have anything exciting happen for you, Derek, in the last couple of weeks or days or? You know, for the first time in my life and in my career, I can, I can feel like Will because I can sit here and say, I had to do some photos this weekend. I had to do a little photo shoot this weekend for something I can't talk about. And oddly, October is going to be a big month because it come the, the announcement comes out in October. So, um, but you know, I'm like Will. I, I can't really talk about it. They they kill me. Um, but you know, first time in my life I can say that. So, um, when we had when you were on last week and we were talking to the gentleman from Copart, and that was a if if anybody hasn't caught our Copart show, go back take a listen to it. We learned a heck of a lot about Copart, and like I said, I've spent a bunch of bunch of time on there, pretending to shop. It's like I used to do on eBay. Um, but you had your car in the background, you know, nice green screen because you were on the office computer, or you were on a better computer. I don't know exactly where you were at, and you, um, we never heard. How did you do at your most recent outing with your your vehicle? Did, did it? Did it? strike up the interest and curiosity that the Derek Moore would expect? Well, I mean, it, it got a lot of attention. I was judging, so I wasn't able to, at the concourse, so I wasn't able to uh, be around it the whole time. But uh, one of one of our listeners uh, uh, that I think is pretty sure is listening tonight uh, is the gentleman I purchased the vehicle from. And But I, I never have my cars judged at an event if I am a judge. I, I don't feel that it's right uh, to to do that. So, you know, didn't have the car judged. So in that case, wouldn't win any kind of awards, anything like that. But definitely got attention, saw a lot of people looking at it. I did get a chance to talk to a few people about it and kind of the unique nature of the car and and its history, which, of course, we're, as everybody that listens to the podcast knows, we're still trying to figure out who the heck built the car uh, in, up in Canada. And uh, if there's any leads out there, we would, I, I would love to have them. 
and try to figure that out. But definitely got attention, definitely got some looks when we were hauled up to the show. A lot of questions everywhere we stopped for gas or food and uh, had people even at stoplights rolling down windows, honking their horns, asking what in the heck it was and uh, all that. So definitely, definitely got a lot of attention and a lot of curiosity around what the heck that thing is. So, Well, tell us what you took. You still hadn't told us. John did just tell us. If you watched the show, it was the green screen last week. Yes, but we are, an, we are an audio podcast. If you watch the video, that's a bonus. But for our, <laughs> we have a lot of audio listeners and we don't have a lot can, of video I can, listeners. I can go back. I can go ahead and tell you I'm not going to go back and watch the live from last week. <laughs> yeah, we know you won't, Will. I have the, um, what do I want to say? The insights. Nobody in Bowling Green and nobody in Hoax Bluff listens to the podcast. So, oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah. We're gonna need to talk about that because thanks, mom and dad. Uh, Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, I over uh, I talked over Derek again as he was saying the Lloyd. So yes, I, I took the I Lloyd watched. to the Cincinnati Concours at Holt Park. That is what we're talking about. They had a micro car class this year. Took it up there. Uh, had a good time. Yes. Are you happy now, Will? Sure. I knew it was the Lloyd, but I didn't know, you know, the people that are listening live right now would probably like to know what you were talking about. Ah. The, uh, I named the episode a little self-centered because I am. I was going to say, why, why is, why is tonight's show <laughs> called John Eats Crow? Because we didn't really have a pre-show here. Did, uh, I don't know if either one of you are enlightened to my two decade relationship with the mini car company, the BMW mini car company. Do either one of you know how my relationship started with them? Uh, did I it involve first, mini trucks? I know the first time you came to Big Oak Garage, you was in one. Yeah, that was Amanda's. That, uh, that was the, the her, her black uh, Ray edition. And that was the first step because in 2001, me and my ex-wife, we ordered and would have had one of the first 20 mini Cooper S's ever delivered. And the dealership we ordered from eh, had excuses and excuses and excuses. And all of a sudden we're four months into deliveries and nobody at this dealership has received a mini. And turns out, well, they're just sitting on our money and they have no intention of ever even opening a mini dealership for reasons that have now been eliminated by many, because at the time you had to build a separate showroom in that. And this BMW dealership felt that eh, they'll waive that. Well, it took them 18 years to waive that. So they sat on our money and it was pretty much a huge deposit on the car, but we got it back with, and Virginia required you to pay interest on it. So it's not like the money went to waste. So I despised Mini until Fiat upset me. And we went and drove by a Mini dealership. And I posted it on Facebook. And the um, Stephanie from the uh, Min, or the Fiat dealership lambasted me for that. And ever since then, she's blocked me from Facebook. But Amanda and I went and bought a Mini. And hers was okay. I didn't. Hers was black with a black, a black lower interior and a black upper interior. And it always felt claustrophobic to me. And it was just a standard Coopers and a little anemic. And well, I decided to re-enter the car world today and the car picture behind me, uh, I went ahead and bought. So it only took 20 years for me to forgive Minnie for screwing me out of one of the first ones. And I stumbled across this uh, 2020 is a used car, 600 miles on it um, and a crazy stupid price. So I at least now have a car I won't feel stupid going into car shows with. And the crazy thing is it's not costing me anything more than my Ford did. <laughs> and my Ford was worth stupid, crazy money on trade because I got almost as much as I paid for it 18 months ago. So nice. I'm a little bit back into the car world. I told everybody I'm going to start crawling back into it. And the bit, and honestly, the biggest thing that put me into a mini, it wasn't the price or anything. It's the people. And again, that's why we're here. And that's kind of the point is, you know, I'm eating crow saying, hey, I went out and bought a mini. Um, but it was the people. 
because every time I gave all the tours while I was at Barber's to the mini club, I think I gave six tours, you know, one a year to the mini club. And they're great people and they always welcome me and whether or not I had a mini with me or whether, you know, anything, I went on drives with them. They're one of the most active clubs in the area. And they even put it on their website. It's it's part of Mini's marketing. You go through their brochure, their 2022 brochure, about 10 pages in, it says, and every car comes with friends because, of, and they list the gatherings and stuff uh, the Mini people do. And it just, it just, everything seemed right and felt right. So I'm... For those people that have known me two decades and have heard me bitch and bitch and whine and cry about minis, and I think a lot of you know that I'm bitching and crying, and I, I don't think I'll ever forgive Fiat. Um, but uh, like I said, I got me a new, I've got me a new toy, and I don't have to whine about my practical Ford anymore. So that was my big, big stepping stone. So, so you're saying a mini is impractical? Yeah, well. It's not as practical that, that as you, you could just be. Yeah. It's, it's not as practical as you could be for that amount of money. Because that amount no. of money will buy you a really nice Ford, Ford Fusion, Ford Escape, um, buy you a decent Dodge Charger. I mean, um, you know, if you wanted, you wanted a, a big ga- you know, group of friends and, and really, you know, come for the car, stay for the people, you could have just went out and got a Corvette. I mean, that's. But then I have to buy new shoes, and I don't buy shoes that often. And I don't own any shorts. New Balance shoes today at this time. You'd, have, you'd have to buy some shorts too. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, I don't wear shorts. <laughs> if I if I swam, I probably would swim in long pants. I I don't think I've, other than gym class in high school, I don't think I've put on shorts since fourth grade. And I skipped gym class quite often in high school. Only had to t- attend one day a week. <laughs> so you Way don't go the- swimming ever. Um, I went swimming. Let's see here. I've been with Zara for three years. I was with Amanda for. Seven. I went swimming ten years ago, and prior to that, I might have went swimming. No, I would doubt I did. I'm thinking I might have went swimming when my ex-wife and I, before we were married, went to uh, Las Vegas. But, yeah, so, no, I probably haven't been in a pool other than one time since high school swimming. So, no, I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't do water sports in all definitions of the word. So. Speaking of pools and relating it to cars... A friendly reminder from No Driving Gloves, don't try to race your vehicles on the street. Hopefully everyone saw the news of the C8 that wound up in the pool um, with somehow three passenger passengers in it. Two of those uh, were killed in the incident. But, you know, just another one of those friendly reminders that, you know, obey the laws on the street. Don't, don't go speeding at 150 mile an hour around a 15 mile an hour turn. Sorry, I had to bring it back to the car world, John. Well, I understand, and it brought pools into it, and but it brought yeah, a kind of a, it brought a kind of a downer. And I'm going to throw something out there since you're on the downer thing. Um, Not on a downer. I'm just trying to remind people to drive safe. Well, we had a. Uh, I had to take a comment down on uh, Facebook this week. I'm not going to mention what it is or anything, but we felt it was very politically related and we don't get political on no driving gloves. As I've said, we'll talk about anything, but we really try to leave politics at the door. Uh, There's no winner in the situation usually. Um, And, you know, I made the contrast. If Joe Biden called me today and said, hey, I want to come on and talk about my Corvette. Guess who you're going to hear? You're going to hear but Joe Biden. And on the same thing, and I'm going to say the horrible words to some people, if Donald Trump called me today and said, hey, I want to talk about my Lamborghinis, guess who you're going to hear? Because I don't care about the politics. I care about the cars. And I just wanted to apologize to those that participated in that comment. That's why it came down. We want to keep it fun. If you want to talk politics, talk politics. And there's a lot of other Facebook pages for it. But um, we'll just drop that one there. It's, you know, I, I... Wanted to explain it, but I didn't want to explain it on Facebook and 
let people have really a lot of opportunity to comment. Now they'll comment on the show. But so we did that. And I wrote down, what was the other? Oh, <laughs> resto mods. <laughs> and we're back. Yes. Because I was quiet during our interview with Greg and Will had brought up his uh, conversation about resto mods and Derek jumped in and I just backed off into the corner. And because I don't have a problem with the term. I know you two do. And the term resto mod to me is a modified restoration, which is that modified. not what they, is that not what they are? It's modified. Yes. It's, it's not a, restored at that point in time. It is modified. When you're doing the restoration, I guess I look at it as you could go ahead and take um I'm trying to think of something. Well, Derek put up the new no driving gloves uh promo vehicle, which is like a fifty eight uh Cadillac DeVille Cadillac I limousine. Put it up. I just sent it to you guys. Yeah. Well, I didn't well put Derek's, it up Derek's in negotiation. I it. Derek's in negotiation for this thing. So it would be like if we totally restored that car and then we said, we don't want this 50s era engine in it. We want to put, well, I'm going to say we want to put a Chevrolet V8 in it, but that's a 50s era engine. But, um, and then we go and put a 50s era engine. Just during the restoration, we're choosing not to put it back original. We're just modifying as we go on. And I think that's where the term resto mod comes in. It's a modified restoration. Uh, the car has been brought, Brought back. What, what does the restoration mean? What the, does the word restoration mean? Well, it depends. Is it an original restoration? It is. A, is it a restoration? It's to bring. It's to is bring it something back to represent history. It's it, a restoration. Is to put something back the way it came. That is a restoration. Modification is. Okay, you're going to make it nice, but you're going to modify it and either make it nicer than what it was or change the way it was. That's modification. So, so it's Will, two I'm, different I'm, things. Wait, I'm going to be that guy right now because in that definition, pretty much every restoration done in the country today, in the world today, is a modified restoration. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because because if you're if you're going to go with the true true definition of a restoration, there's there's really no way to restore something back to exactly no when it came out of factory. You're going to modify something. Uh, you know, most guys, you know, unfortunately, uh, in some cases tend to decide to paint their 20s era car with base coat clear coat and it looks horrible. Because the car never looked like that originally. I'm sorry, a Model T should not have a base coat, clear coat on it that looks like a brand new Toyota coming out of the factory. Uh, you know, and and nobody's going to take the time to sit there and well, very few people. I do know a few that that have done it, but very few people, one or two in the world, will actually brush paint an early car to make it look appropriate. Tell Dave hi for me. And, you know, if you do everything you can possibly do to put your car back original as close to as it was when it came off the showroom floor, I'll give it to you. That's a restoration. All right. Because there's no way that you can put a Model T exactly the way it came off the showroom floor. You can't do it. That paint is not available. You know, the rivets aren't available. I mean, there's just certain things that you just cannot physically get anymore. I understand that. And yes, that is a, to me, that's a restoration. If you put a car back original, it is a restoration. If you take a car that had drum brakes from the factory or no brakes from the factory, you put brakes on it, you've modified that car. All right. And the example that John used, if you do an engine swap, no, no, that is not nowhere near a restoration. You have done, changed, and modified that car. It turns into a custom car at that point in time. Okay, now wait, wait, stop right there because I want to, I want to, I want to, and, and this is just 
playing devil's advocate, you know, throwing a theory out there. So what about having a restoring? So I'll take my 74 Pontiac GTO that I had okay. and, you know, put it back completely original. I mean, my dad and I went through everything we could to make sure that car was completely original. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm reading the comment. <laughs> Better to talk politics than uh, <laughs> rest, rest of mods from uh, Mr. Brooks out there. Very, very no, true, I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll get more pissed off talking about resto mods and politics. I promise. <laughs> it's it's way more fun. Uh, but you know what if so what and it had the original. Uh, you know the engine was original. You know the the codes all match. I mean it was the engine that came in the car. Transmission was transmission in the car. All that. But there are people that like to, you know, take that and you've got the original engine. Okay. So it is the original Pontiac 350 V8. Punch it out 30 over and add a cam, add a hot cam. It's modified. What's your definition? It's modified. Resto mod. No. (laughs) (laughs) But, but is it, is it modified completely or is it a resto mod because it is the original block? Original numbers matching, everything would match here, if somebody checked here, it out. But the internals why, have been changed slightly to give it more power. Here's here's why I say that. You hot rodded that engine. You put a cam in it, you added compression, you added cubic inches, you hot rodded that engine. You gave it more power than what the executives at Pontiac or the government allowed them to put in that car. You changed it. It's modified. At that point in time, it's not a restoration. Now, what you could do is buy another engine, build it the way you want it, make it a hot rod, slide it in there, restore your other engine, and guess what? If you want it to be a rest, a, a restored car, pull your hot rod engine out, slap your original engine in. I mean, that's what hot rod. That's how hot rodding started. Was pulling your engine out and giving it more power and putting it back in. That's where the term hot rod come from. It's not a resto mod. No, no such thing. Well, you've asked in both shows, and you've never let me answer the question. What is the definition of restoration? The action of returning something to a former owner, place, or condition. We're We're talking condition. Right. And I totally agree. And what I'm saying is if I take a 65 Mustang at GT and I totally restore it and I make it perfect and we'll say I even went back in time and I got you know everything so it's the original paint. It's a literally exactly how it came off of uh, the, the production line. And then I decided, no, I wanted a faster motor. And so I go ahead and put a Coyote V8 in it, which I'm going to modify the car to do. But I've restored it, and now I've modified it. Hence, it's a resto mod because it's explaining the actions that have happened in that car's life. It has been restored. The only difference what people are doing that are building these resto mods are is they're not wasting the money to put that original 289 four-barrel in there. They are skipping that step and just putting the Coyote in to begin with. So you're going to put a coyote motor with <laughs> 500 horsepower in a stock Mustang with drum brakes, little bitty tires, and everything else. That's what you're going to do. Live it well, on I'm, I'm, I'm asking a question here. Well, I'm, because just, then, I'm basically then, saying is it's it's kind of like your analogy earlier. If I built that car and then I hot rodded out a 289 and, you know, swapped it in and out of the car, now I've got to, sw- you're, you weren't going as far as, well, I got to upgrade the transmission. I got to up- upgrade the drive shaft. I got to upgrade the differential. I got to upgrade right. the brakes. That's but, what happens. But that's what happens. And, but I've, you know, I'm saying instead of wasting all the time and money of putting it all the way back to that stock 65 car and then modifying it, I'm choosing as I'm quote restoring it to modify my actions during the restoration. At that point in time, it is modified. It's a street machine. It's a hot rod. 
It's whatever you want to call it. It's not a restoration. Because you, just said it's you want to call not it. put it back to the, f- the way it <laughs> former was. But but here and that that is that is the problem. And I think I said it the last time we had this conversation about terminology that's being used in the automotive, the collector car hobby industry, whatever you want to call it, is that people are just calling things whatever they want. You know, this may be a way to put it to uh, put it to rest because I you know I think everybody's kind of I'm I'm kind of on Will's side here. I don't like these labels and these terms. Uh, because I don't think they're fitting, but you know, here's the question: If you have, if you have an original, all original car, an unrestored car, and if anybody does this, I will never talk to you again. Will, if you have a completely original, untouched car, let's say you know somebody rolls into Will's shop, they've got a, well, let's let's take a, a Bel Air, 1956 Chevy Bel Air completely original untouched this thing has 5,000 miles on it they pulled it out of a little old lady's garage everything's perfect they walk into will's shop and they say well you know it's it's just got the the little v8 in it i want to put a i want to ls swap it is it does it go out into the world being a a a rigimod a rigimod rigimod? (laughs) I love it. It goes out into the world as a modified original, but I like the term Origimod. Maybe I'm going to change the name of the uh, episode, Origimod. <laughs> Origimod. That's hilarious. But seriously, is that what that you would not, it would be a modified or a, a hot rod at that point. And like I said, well, if Will ever does it, I'll never talk to him again because you I've already, that I've, already, I've already done it, so don't feel bad. That's a perfect that example. Right there, that right there is being done every day. Yeah. Every I know day. that's a perfect to example of a, you know doing it, you know doing it yesterday, doing it today, and doing it tomorrow. <laughs> it needs to stop on original cars. I don't care if you do it to a field find rust bucket, but if it's a nice original car. Try to leave it alone, please. Apparent, That's fine. Apparent, apparently, apparently, you didn't see pictures of the dart before we started on it. It was a really nice original car. Hey, Will, have you heard about that exhibit that I've got at the museum now called Corvette Powered? Yep. <laughs> yeah. I have. Yeah, there's a really cool Riddler Award winner in there. Yeah, it, it was probably a really nice original Impala when it came to Chip Foose's shop, too. I, I understand that was taken right off of an old gentleman's uh, GM showroom with the window sticker stuck, still stuck there yeah. before Chip took it. Uh, no. So anyway, you're not going to call it an Origimod, okay? Well, I had another thing that would create arguments and discussions, but I think we'll, we'll wait for fun. another episode. We'll, we'll we'll wait for another episode on um, the manual transmission, automatic transmission discussion. We've still got 20 minutes. Come on. Well, we've still got 20 minutes. Let me pop we've over still got here. Got 20 and... minutes on mod. <laughs> no, I told Will we wouldn't dwell on it for 20 minutes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, y'all going to drive me to drinking. But be careful. Uh, we don't believe Copart is actually selling that hot rod Lincoln. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's, that's a little, yeah. But always remember, drive to the drinking, never drive after the drinking. Another PSA from No Driving Gloves. You may as well just take the Uber there and take the Uber back. Mm -hmm. I was trying to quickly flip through, and somehow I'm on all these cool custom pickups. And I don't want to go to Uber. Not even I mean cool stock pickups. Speaking of Uber and Lyft, I think they need to add a a uh, maybe a classic uber or antique and classic uber where you can show up in you know your antique car just roll up in my 31 chrysler to pick some people up and then maybe they need the resto mod uber where you show up in a resto mod and yeah what's the rest of the <laughs> i've still yeah, never I, seen I, would, one. I wouldn't know what you're going to show up in Derek. unicorn but seriously, I think it'd be cool if some company did that. Now, insurance, things like that would probably be insanity. But I feel like we need some kind of service out there where people can show up and, you know, or, you know, go on Uber or Lyft or something and, and be able to get rides in antique cars. 
Haggerty, Haggerty's got something close to that, that, that ride. Yeah, ride right there. there. Okay, yeah. you, you, you brought it up, and I'm going to have to say his name. It's like an Uber for classic cars. Now, Richard Rawlings. It's an it's like an Uber for classic cars. Now it's that something I can get behind. Check out our friends at Rock and Roll Rides. <laughs> I'm gonna leave there you now. <laughs> RichardRawlings.com or something like that. I mean, I gotta stop sharing my ideas on this podcast. Well, you've got to start having some original ones. This is a Kickstarter idea. Let me see how old it is. Well, uh, my idea. Um. It was uh, it was my original so, idea. You know what Richard Rawlings is doing? He's a ridge modifying it. Well, he he what his problem is? He did this too early. Uh, this was a Kickstarter that ended October twenty seventh, two thousand fifteen. Richard Rawlings wasn't over the top famous by then. If he'd do this now, he was trying to raise fifty thousand dollars, and they raised eleven thousand nine hundred twenty eight dollars. So I think if he did it now, he'd have no problem raising the fifty grand. He'd just pull it out of his pocket. Like, well, he, he walks pocket. around with a wad like that all the time, according to TV. Always got to have that cash ready. And it looked like they were going to have locations in Detroit, Raleigh, St. Louis, Dallas, Houston, Fort Worth. Where the hell they just need to do it. You just need to do it like Uber, where yeah. you just submit your car and, you know, go from there. Well, that was the other um, one. It was a uh, Quora question when I Googled uh, Derek's thing. And that Uber will let you run a classic car if you're a commercial account and have multiple vehicles or something. I'm just saying what was posted to Quora. Don't know how intelligent or how accurate that statement is, but... Last time, last time I looked into it, there were a bunch of you couldn't do it with Uber because there were all the insurance things of seat belts and yeah, 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 all the safety things. So you wouldn't be able to use anything, you know, pre late seventies essentially. Yeah, you had to have. A, it's got to be a certain year model. But would you yeah. really like to roll up in your nineteen nineteen Chevrolet to you know uh, use a club for my uh, youth, Big Al's? And have some guy come stumbling out of that strip club drunk at one in the morning and get in your car and you get about halfway home and he redecorates your interior with uh <laughs> But that's the thing with the nineteen nineteen. You put the top down, you pull it into a uh <laughs> car wash and you hose the whole thing down. Done. So so I you're saying just- you're, we just you're had the a designated driver at my next party. <laughs> we just we just had a pretty good comment on, on Facebook live here. How big is too big on wheels. This could be very interesting, being that look, a lot look, of the early wheel, cars wheel, had big wheels. Size doesn't matter. Width matters, though. Yeah, I was uh, thinking. I like just this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I, it, it's it, that's an interesting question, is because I mean there are there are antique cars out there that have. 24, 26, 30 inch rim. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're massive. Did I'm did trying to remember the rims. Old... Did yeah. you say rims? Rims. Okay. Why? We, we did skip over uh, Mr. Harris's comment back as a partner with Hagerty Drive Share would be cool. Other than if you go back three episodes and listen to Derek and I's discussion about Hagerty. <laughs> wait, wait, I want to go back. What, what, what? Was there a problem that I said rims? No. no. Will Will gets real picky about rims and wheels and tires and the terminology. We got to remember. If that's will, what you want to call them, that's fine. Will, Will, will got that. Derek's will talking three more stuff. 490s, all the early cars had what were called demountable rims. The okay. rim actually demounts off the wheel to change the tire. So they did have that size rims. Got you. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know why. I know why you call them rims. Yeah, because yeah, that, that, that's that was the right. That was the term for then. So you yeah, had it, would, it would you be had cooler rim. to have yeah, rocket tight. racing rims rather than rocket racing wheels, though. No, it would be triple no. R instead of double R W. No, <laughs> no. 
So anyway, back to our conversation. Yes, I mean, antique cars, I mean, there have been massive wheels out there since very early on. So I don't think any wheel's too big as long as it's appropriate for the car. Now, I mean, if you get into hot rod and resto modding and stuff like that, you know, who cares? I'm I'm uh on, on a hot rod on a you know a vintage vintage hot rod. There's there's some cars out there you can put some 22s on like a like a big Cadillac or something like that. But generally a 20 20 is about as big as I would like to go or is what it, I'm going to go on on the cars and the styles that we build at Big Oak and you know you got these stupid ass trucks out there that are squatting in the back and I mean they're running 28s with mud tires like that I mean it makes no sense to me at all if you like it hey that's great I don't fault you that for that but definitely not my style and I don't really like looking at them to be honest with you I mean, it does go back to your style, what you like. I mean, I, my that Edge Sport had factory 22s on it. It's one reason I like the truck, and, you know, I, probably why I bought it, because the wheels were cool on it. But when you get in, I mean, it, it really depends. If it's a daily, you don't need anything bigger than really a 22. you got to have some sidewall, and otherwise you're breaking wheels all the time. But 30s and 34s on your Camaro. Um, yeah, no, I'm out. That, that, that. I would say in answer to the question that was proposed is if you don't have to modify your wheel well just for an aesthetic purpose, maybe, you know, when you've got to start going into your Camaro or whatever and modifying that fender so that that your tire fits in it, um, that, that might be the rule. But again, if you like it and you got the money, I mean, how big is too big? As long as the tire fits the wheel and there's a wheel to fit the tire. And that's where you know, I say it gets into the cigar game too, is you, know, you, if somebody's willing to make part, part a to fit part B and part B to fit part a, you're good. But at some point, somebody's going to say, wait a second, we don't need 43 inch tires. We're only going to sell eight of them. So, that you know that's what's going to dictate it is if people would just quit buying them but until then i don't think there's a maximum it's kind of like is there really a minimum i mean we get down to 12 inch wheels on some things lots of luck ever finding a tire for them but. <laughs> uh there there are some trucks being built some late model trucks that are you know bagged and body dropped with you know 24s 28s and some of those do look pretty cool well, if you're going to uh, see so you get into that, you you body drop. So the the, the body hits the floor. Right. Um, if you you can put a wheel and tire package on there that you don't have to put a wheel well in your hood. You know, you don't have to raise the hood. Right. I think you're OK. But, when, you know, we're going to get to the point that people are going to start having that tire start peeking out over that hood lip or that bed. Oh, lip that, that's sorry. That's and I'm that's that's sorry. Yeah. It's already yeah. being done, and I don't really like it. But yeah. there's there's a shop in Oklahoma, I think, called Fat Fabs, and they're kind of that's kind of their big thing right now. Is I think they done one that had thirties on the back, like a regular cab, new Chevrolet truck. I don't know if I had thirties on the front, but I think I had thirties on the back. And I, you know, it it looked it looked pretty badass. Uh, not I, I I would personally never do anything like that, but I enjoy looking at it. You know, you know, I saw and it was the weirdest thing. Of course, I, I'm, I'm a fan of open wheel racers, you know, especially like brass era, early stuff. I, I kind of dig the look of a fenderless hot rod, stuff like that. But I saw and, and I understand it for the purpose of rock crawling and off roading and things like that. But I saw a Jeep on the way to work the other day that they put such big tires on it, they had to take the fenders off the Jeep. And it just doesn't look right. On the road, as a road-going vehicle, it just doesn't look right 
for that. I, I get it if you're going to be trailing, you know, doing off-road stuff and you're not going to be running it on road, but it just, I was, I was driving down the road and it was ahead of me and I was catching up to it. And I was just like, what is that? And when I got up to it, it was just, I don't know. It just, it doesn't look right. I agree with that. If you're going to, if you're going to purpose build it, take the fenders off so you don't rip them off. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. But if you're just taking them off cause your tires are going to rub going down the interstate <laughs> cause they're too big. That's you know, not really me. No, and I they, build useless. I build useless stuff every day. There's so a I mean, question. I, yeah, yeah, that's true. I, mean, I can't. I can't really. I can't really say much about it. I mean, we build. We build cars that go to car shows and sit there and drive some. Uh, so I mean, I, I know what it's about. But I drive a useless Tahoe. You can't really haul nothing in it, but two people. But it looks cool. So if that person thinks it looks cool. And they like it. Hey, more power to you. Well, this first time viewer is really popping us up some questions here. And, you know, is there a fine line on offset to width? Um, RJ, you know, shut up. <laughs> what, what? Oh, great. It's, it's one of Will's friends, <laughs> isn't it? What's yeah, considered oh, oh, yeah. too much lift in the classic genre? Hey, Bigfoot had a massive lift and he's a 74 pickup. So. What well, he was running, what size of wheels was on the original 1974 Bigfoot? Ooh. You're the man with the computer in front of you, John. Well, that's just I, should, I... I should rephrase that. The computer that can actually handle <laughs> doing research at the same time as podcasting, because I know my internet speed can't handle that. I, I just laid out big bucks for another router. House isn't big enough for a mesh system, and it seems to be working so far, but... Um... They had, well, do you want to talk big? Um, the 74 Bigfoot ran three different tire sizes. Where did it go? Um, six, 44, 66, and 120. So, so I guess 120 tires. inch wheel and tire package is probably about as big as you should go. <laughs> Well, and it, it also comes down to what Will, you know, what Will and I were just talking about, which is what is your purpose in the end? You know, because there are laws about what you can run on the street, how, you know, road clearance laws, you know, how high can your bumper be? How high can headlights. certain parts of the body be? Huh? Headlights is a big thing. Yeah, your headlights, how they're aimed, you know, and, and we're seeing that with the um i guess what originally was called the california show truck now it's called the carolina squat do i have that right yeah yep. something like that the anyway you know they're they're coming down on them for the headlight level you know not having it aimed right and of course also the visibility of that type of sit Same. so it really comes down to in the end what do you in in my opinion i'll say and will you might have a different opinion but it comes down to what's what's the purpose, you know? Or are you a show vehicle that's going on and off a trailer and only onto the show field or in the, you know, show building? Or are you trying to drive the thing down the road? And or are you trying to put it on a racetrack? You know, it's it's going to be different, probably different answers for each each use. Yep. And I and I will say, not every car that's come out of Big Oak Garage has been one hundred percent legal, but. Most of the stuff that comes out of here is, you know, 100% legal that meets the requirements of a, of a car from whatever state, you know, this person comes from. So technically everything we do is street legal and, and most of them are even updated to have even better equipment than what they came with factory. So most of our cars do leave with seat belts and better steering and bigger brakes and better engine and trans combos and stuff like that tires. So, you know, I, I'm a big fan of driving your car. I hate, I hate one-to-one -one scale models, but some people, they want to push their car off and on a trailer and never crank it, never drive it and just show it. And if that's, if that's what you like, that's awesome. You know, I, I have nothing bad to say about that. I would, I would rather somebody be into that that's actual 
hands-on automobile stuff than, you know, just going out and doing nothing. Yeah. Sorry, I got tied up on my Bigfoot research. I was incorrect. Bigfoot 2 was the first truck to run 66-inch tires. And then Bigfoot... I think we get to... Bigfoot 5, built in 1986, was designed for use with 10-foot-tall Firestone Tundra tires. And then Bigfoot 7 was built specifically for the movie Roadhouse, uh, where it destroyed a new car showroom and crushed four new cars in a scene that cost $500,000, shot in one take, and also used in Tango and Cash. And then in 95, it was modified to fit the 10-foot tall tires and was sold to somebody who went broke. And now it's on display in Kissimmee, Florida. So, sorry, i just curious about where the, the tires went and the trucks went. So, you know. Still not the most epic movie scene of, of destruction uh, of a, a car dealership. Sorry. The original Gone in 60 Seconds is probably one of the best. Well, there was a lot of destruction in that, but we got to be careful talking about that. It might be copyrighted, trademarked. I'm just, I'm just saying the name of the movie, the original <laughs> version. Watch it. May or may not have a yellow Mustang in it with a name. Yes. Uh, there was an, also another fantastic movie with a lot of uh, chase scenes and um, you know damages being done. And they were brothers that liked to sing the blues. So that's a good topic for a future show. I'm going to write that one down, Caleb, on uh, where will hot rodding go with the age demographic changing each year. I don't even want that to touch on that. I don't topic. I don't want to touch on that one now. I think we could we could go 15 minutes on that, and we are approaching, I believe, that 60 minute mark. It does. It's 5917 in the corner. Um, and what type headlight should I use on my horrid Pinto? Um, I don't think you should use headlights on that. Um, I think, I think you just duct tape a couple, uh, uh flashlights to the hood. Don't you? Uh, those, uh, six volt plastic flashlights you pick up at Home Depot for, you know, two for two ninety eight. Actually, if you get the Fisher price ones, you can change the color of the lenses to like red or green. Every time you stop, you can get out and change the color. Or you go retro and you drive in reverse and let the flames light the way. Mm. I, would go, I would just go get one of those huge light bars that these big monster trucks have on them, these tooted out Carolina lean trucks, and just put it on the on the roof. Big thousand watt LED light bars. Yeah, that's what I would do with if I had a horrid Pinto. I got a friend who just got a... And, uh, then, and then I would put it out Baja in the field Beetle and shoot guns at it. <laughs> yeah. how, many, how many candle power do we need? Candle. <laughs> well, Derek, don't yours actually literally have one candle power? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't have any cars with candle, candle power lights yet. I, I got to... I'll get there. I'll Give me time. I'll get there. Well, Caleb said, and I was just saying that I have a friend who just bought a Baja bug that uses one of those LED light bars, too. But that could be kind of cool to pop the headlights out and just replace the grill and the headlights with one of those big, long light bars. But I'm not the automotive stylist here. I'm just the podcast host. And I was going to kind of say, we're going to wrap it up for tonight. Um, I've had fun tonight. I don't know if we've accomplished anything or made a hill of beans to the world. Um, nope. I guess I might start showing up at some car shows locally, so watch out for me. Um, I really would put Eat Crow on my license plates, but I love my podcast license plate or tag, depending where you live. So I probably will stay with podcast. But uh, Eat Crow would be very appropriate because I have not said a lot of nice things about many for many, many, many years. Um, but that's good. I want to congratulate Will again on his win. Um, I mean, he talks about you know, winning and winning and winning. But um, I knew this guy 20 years ago, 22 years ago, and he, you know, he just 18 year old partying kid. And he's, he's kind of made something of himself. And 
there's a touch of jealousy in this guy. And Derek's okay too. Kind of made but it. So. You haven't made face- it. Follow the Facebook page, No Driving Gloves. Check out the website, nodrivinggloves.com. Links to all the shows. If there's a video with the show, it's paired with the show anymore. Uh, So you can watch or listen there. You can find links to YouTube, Facebook. Um, Might have the Instagram up there too. And like I said, start watching the Instagram and learning about the history of the automobile. We might even forewarn you. Derek's idea makes a lot of sense. Tell you the day before. That way you can go and press your friends at work. But... I had fun tonight, guys. I'm out of here. Adios. See you, guys. Oh, hi, Jimmy. I guess that's <laughs> Will's dad. <laughs> Somebody from Hoax Bluff is actually watching. Whoa, <laughs> we got a Hoax Bluff listener. Well, and that's the guy we yelled at at the beginning for not listening. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> We're out of here. Burning. <laughs>